video, two, one. Thank you. The first death from coronavirus. All of the people in the recent past that have become Christians. Loved ones of Breonna Taylor grieving and outraged. And that's why that phrase, Jesus is Lord, is so incredibly powerful. Ordinary images tonight of deadly explosions in Lebanon. How do we respond when darkness and fear is everywhere? The reason why you see the anger in Minneapolis One minute, you just is because this okay. is not the first time. This is an elevated case of no, no, this is what you think. No, no, no. Stunning news. The president of the United States now confirming to the world that he and the first lady of the, of the United States have both tested positive for the coronavirus. Good morning. Hi, everybody. It's, it's good to be with all of you this morning. Uh, if you're watching us online, we're super grateful to have you once again. Um, welcome to our church, and I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, so I don't know. Um, maybe it's not feedback. But anyway, welcome, welcome back. And I know that, that, that we don't have a ton of people in, in the room here, um, but in spirit, it, there is so many. So, so uh, don't be discouraged as, as you get here. This is uh, honestly phased as we, as we think about how best to do this. And so um, God, is, God is working to kind of bring us together in a new way and for us to understand it. Um, and so I just, it's been awesome to hear your voices. Your voices remind me so much of the choir of angels, I imagine, uh, in heaven one day. And so um, I just, I'm really grateful to be with you. Um, as always, thank you so much for joining us online. Um, it, it is, is con I'm continue to be excited um, that so many people get a chance to watch this and from all over the place. If if you're from a new place, I, I, I know you do it in the beginning, but drop where you're, where you're watching us from. Uh, we want to say hello. We want to connect with you. Um, and, and if you're brand new here, you can drop. I'm new, and we'd love to connect with you that way as well. Uh, this weekend, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Um, he's one of uh, the many heroes in our country who fought uh, to, to make what he experienced a little bit more, more like the worldview of Jesus. Um, and each year, as a tradition, I have, uh, for, for many, many years, gone back and listened to the I Have a Dream speech this weekend. And uh, this week, I listened to it again. And once again, I'm inspired uh, by Martin Luther King's um, communication power, but also his courage to say something that at the time was not a common view at all. Thanks, bro. Um, he would say um, in, in, the, in, the, in the speech something that um, kind of always stirred my soul. He says, I have a dream that, that sons of former slaves and sons of former slaves' owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood, that unity would be forged in our country. Um, and also is just a reminder that during this weekend, um, that as we celebrate that, that uh, we really have a long way to go in our country. That that, that, is, that, illust that, um, that thought of what Martin Luther King's vision was and the vision of Jesus, for that matter, um, has yet to uh, come to fruition, that we still have a journey ahead of us. And, and I know that, um, that this past week and on Wednesday, or not this past week, but the week before on Wednesday, um, the stuff that happened in the Capitol continued to kind of um, stoke the, the flames of division within our country. Um, I'm sympathetic to those who, who saw what happened on Wednesday and saw the Confederate flags waving in the Capitol and, and thought of that kind of as an illustration of our, of our nation's demonic challenge with race. Um, I'm also sympathetic to those who, uh, from the Hispanic community especially, uh, who are now fearful that, that some of the systems and the beliefs that, that their family fred, fled from in Cuba or Venezuela or other Latin American countries, um, you believe is now coming to our nation. And I've spoken to so many of you, and, and though I, I don't know where I stand on a lot of these issues, I, I've thought, um, I've tried my hardest to, to walk in your shoes for a little bit, and I'm trying my hardest to learn to have more mercy than I do judgment. Um, and maybe on this holiday, the holiday where we celebrate Martin Luther King's um, birthday, that we can try to do that a little bit more, to have more mercy than we do judgment. But see, my, my major concern as a minister is less about um, those political issues, though I do care about those political issues. My, my major issue is not really about our political affiliations, though I, I think that's important, or maybe even our social al uh, alliances. Uh, but my major concern as a friend and as a minister of the gospel, as those, um, as uh, uh, for all of you who are in your homes, my, my major concern is this simple question, which is who are you following? Who are you following? Today, as Josh mentioned, we are continuing our series called Picking Up the Pieces, where we've been talking about the fact that 2020 was a year where God exposed our brokenness. And that's not something for us to regret, but instead for us, to some, uh, that's something for us to be grateful for. Because broken people are really the only people that God can put back together in a more beautiful way. 
And last week we talked about the idea that we have cracks in our emotional world right now, that we're feeling overwhelmed or anxious. I gave you a 10-question survey. If you didn't watch us last week online, I encourage you to go check out the link after this service. But, but we ended with the thought that if your lifestyle is producing anxiety, burnout, irritability, mild uh, depression, etc., then there's something about the way in which you order your life that is not like Jesus. Because Jesus' life did not have those same emotional pitfalls. Jesus instead invited us to have rest. And I tease this idea that Jesus was giving us a new way to order our lives. And that he would, that, that he would later say produce life and life to the full. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so here's the question that we're really going to think about for a little bit. Who are you following? You know, our culture has kind of turned a corner on, on this whole idea of who uh, following people. When I grew up, one of the worst things in the world you could be was a follower. One of my favorite songs, this is a terrible song, so don't listen to it, um, but I, I, loved, I love Mob Deep. He's one of my favorite rappers. Um, he has a song called Don't Be a Follower. It's terribly ungodly, but that, that's, the, that's the idea. When I was growing up, that was the thought. You, you, if someone bought a pair of sneakers, you definitely didn't buy that same pair of sneakers. Even if you loved them, you had to at least buy a different colorway or, or something, because if you bought the, the same pair of sneakers, then you had no style. And there was nothing worse than having no style where I grew up. Style was about being unique, being a snowflake, you know, that you're the, you're the only person in the universe like you. It was very cool to be different, and it was very corny to be just like everybody else. But something in our society has begun to change. It's kind of interesting to me that there are people now who are okay with following people. Think of the landscape of social media. The thought is you have followers or a following, and you have influencers, people who are being paid to sort of lead you in a direction. We ask questions about people's following. How many people are interested, let's say, in what you're doing, how, how, what you ate for dinner last night, your, your, what you're buying or what you're saying or how you're responding? You have people who, again, are paid to be influencers, where their profession is to influence their followers. It's, in essence, you, know, you have 208 million people who want to dress like, look like, act like, smell like, buy like Ariana Grande. It's interesting, that would have been so, so whack when I was growing up. <laughs> but today we're becoming accustomed to this idea of following people. We follow our favorite anchors and their opinions on the news sites we watch, their talking points and their view of the world. And through their influence, their opinions become our opinions. We follow our favorite uh, bloggers on YouTube and we even buy their merch. We have Mr. Beast shirts and PewDiePie stuff and if you like the Marvel Olympics guy, you buy his hoodie. Whatever it is, we're, we're constantly being led to purchase, to consume, to look at, to respond like, to dress like, to absorb like we, uh, to the people we follow. We are a nation of followers. We follow people on HGTV and the latest home trends. We all want shiplap in our homes because of Joanna Gaines. We dress like the M NBA stars or, or, or the, we buy the gowns of the Duchess of Wales or whatever. We follow people. We follow our political parties. And even if we think, you know, I'm not a sheep, I'm not being led by anybody, I have my own opinions, even those opinions you got from somebody you were following. We're a nation of followers. So the question really is, is that wrong? Is it wrong to be a follower? Well, maybe, but a better question is actually this question. Who are you following? It may come as no surprise to most of us, but God has a lot to say about following. In the scriptures, following isn't seen as a positive or a negative thing, but in scriptures, what is clearly understood is that the value of following is completely dependent upon who you choose to follow. The Bible has no issue with people following other people. The Bible has a significant amount to say about who you choose to follow. I mentioned last week that Jesus was a rabbi, and that idea of Jesus being a rabbi actually has tremendous impact or tremendous implications for the way in which we live our lives as followers or as disciples. In a moment, we're going to get to Mark chapter 1, so you can go ahead and turn there, but I want to nerd out for you for just a second, um, because I think it will help tie this whole lesson together. 
In the first century, discipleship was the apex of the um, Jewish education system. When, when you were uh, between the ages of 0 and 12, what happened is that you were sent to school. Um, men and women were both sent to school where they learned mathematics and, and reading and writing and kind of some of the basic stuff, right? And so... They would go to school from ages 0 to 12 and learn all that stuff. But in addition to basics, reading, writing, a little bit of, a little bit of math, they would also learn to memorize all, if not mo most, if not all, of the Torah. So think about this. If you have a 12-year-old son or daughter, your 12-year-old knows the entire first five books of the Bible by heart. Kind of crazy. After you were 12, you would kind of graduate from primary school, and you would be sent to um, work as an apprentice with your dad or, or uh, in the field or a tanner as a, as, a, as a fisherman or whatever it was. But if you were a woman, you would, be, you would, be, um, you would get married, you would begin to have children. We've come a long way in our society, amen. Um, but 12 and 13-year-olds, that, that's what they would do. But if you were at the top of your class, if you were like number, you know, somewhere in the, in the top 30%, you would get sent off to the school of learning. And the school of learning or the house of learning would be the place where you would actually have a paid teacher to help you understand the more kind of biblical teachings throughout the scriptures. And so during that process, you would spend between the ages of uh, 12 and 16 in those schools, and you would learn and you would learn and you would learn. And hopefully by the end of it, you would memorize the entire Old Testament. Did you hear that? Some of us haven't even read the entire Old Testament. <laughs> memorize the entire Old Testament. That was level one, and then level two was that, right? But if you were the top of the class, if you were summa cum laude, if you were a Rhodes Scholar, you would have a chance to move into level three. Level three is where you could become a Talmudim, or an apprentice, Another word the Bible uses a lot is a disciple to a rabbi. If you were lucky enough, you could get interviewed by a rabbi, and the rabbi would ask you how many questions you understood uh, or would ask you questions about the Torah or the Mishnah. And if you had what it took, if you had the smarts or the, uh, or, or the intelligence or the acumen or the, the work ethic or the drive or the, the knack or the, or the talents and ability to become a rabbi you yourself, then what would happen is he would come to you and he would look at you and he would say, come follow me. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you hear that line, you're like, I know that's in the scriptures often. Because you're right, Mark chapter 1, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into, lake, into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Verse 19 when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, probably saying the same line, come follow me. And they left their nets, left their father Zebedee, I'm sorry, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. If you turn the page, one page over, chapter 2, verse 13, you see the same thing happen. Once again, Jesus went out beside the, uh, of the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of uh, Alpheus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Remember what I said before, that the disciples, the, the, the people who became disciples were incredibly educated men. They were people who had understood and memorized so much of the Bible. And so you may recall this idea that the, when, when, the, when the disciples were first kind of being launched in their, mission, in their mission in the book of Acts, they said that they were unschooled and ordinary, meaning they hadn't gone through that. Instead, they went to apprentice. And then one day they were called by Jesus, trained by Jesus. Mark chapter 3 same idea. Jesus went out to the mountainside, and he called those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed the twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. One more. This is Mark chapter 8. It's not just for the selected. It's for everyone. Or it's not just for the few selected. It's for everyone. When he called the crowd now, that's thousands, to him along with his disciples, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. 
Jesus, just like a modern-day influencer, calls anybody who wishes to follow him. No pedigree, no academic excellence, just normal old people like you and me. And Jesus is saying, you can be my apprentice, no schooling required, just come and follow me. And if you do, I will give you a new way to live. Last week I said that he offered a yoke, and a yoke equals a way. And Jesus would later say that he is the way. Think about this. He said, I am the way to the Father, the way to heaven. And through him, what he's saying is that if you follow the way he lives and you follow and you order his steps like he ordered his steps and, and you follow the way he passed his time and, the, and your spending and your resources and, and, and the way you lived your life and maintain your relationship, what he's saying is that his influence was going to bring you towards the Father and towards heaven. You know, influencers try to point you in a direction. They say, hey, if you follow me, you might be rich like me. If you follow me, you may look like me. If you follow me, you might smell like me. If you follow me, you may live the lifestyle I have lived. But what's so amazing is that Jesus says, if you follow me, I'm going to give you eternal life and also life here on earth. And so when the, when the Bible unfolds, you start hearing in Acts chapter 24, verse 14, that the disciples are now referred to as the way. He was a rabbi, their lord, their influencer, and they were followers, apprentices, disciples. We have to begin to put this in a first century or 21st century context to make it really make sense, and then I promise I'll bring this all home. I know I've been talking a lot, so just, you know, strap in your seatbelt. There's a lot going on here. In Jesus' time, the role of a disciple was really found in three goals. I'm going to share what those three goals are and then how they relate to us today. The first goal was that you wanted to be with your rabbi. Think about what Jesus said in Mark chapter 3. He says he appointed the 12 that they might be with him. They might be with him. To be a disciple was to be with your rabbi 24-7. All day, every day, you would literally follow him around. You would eat all your meals with him. You would sleep at his side. You would live at his side. There's a really well-known blessing from the first century that sounds something like this. May, the, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Keep in mind, they lived in the desert in the first century. And so what, what that meant is that they would literally be following behind Jesus. And as he would walk, the smoke would, or the, the, the dust would billow behind him, and they would be covered with his dust. It was literal. You wanted to be so close to him that you could be covered with the dust from the, that was lifted off the steps he took. And here's the implication. You may have already made it in your mind. I'm just trying to connect the dots. But as a follower of Jesus, the first, and I would argue the most important goal in your whole life is to be with Jesus. Now, you may say, I've heard that before. That doesn't really impress me. But I don't think you understand the implication of it. What it means to be with Jesus, to live in a constant state of awareness that God is in your life, constantly thinking about Jesus, constantly thinking about his spirit, constantly thinking about God the Father, living in a constant state where the spirit is dwelling you, where God's word is consistently popping up in your heart. You remember Galatians chapter 5 where it says, keep in step with the spirit. Live as though the spirit is pushing up dust that is covering you. Decide to carve out time in the morning, in the night, throughout the day to connect with him in prayer, in meditation. Notice that, that, man, what you're doing in your life in any given moment, does this include the presence of God? Okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm cooking food for my, for my family. How is this about the glory of God? Huh, okay, um, yeah, Lord, you made this awesome meal. You made these great plants that I could stick into this, into this stew. You put life into this animal that was then slaughtered for, so I could consume. Whatever, right? You, you have a sense of the presence of who God is in your life. You aren't just on cruise control all day long, numbing yourself, 
Think about John chapter 15. This is what Jesus, one of the most famous teachings on this matter. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus' metaphor for how to be with him is a branch remaining in the vine, constantly connected. You've never seen a living branch on the ground. Every living branch that's on the, or every branch that's on the ground is a dead branch. And that's the point. You can only live as a disciple connected to your source, attached constantly, gaining your self-assurance, gaining your hope and your self-worth, realizing that, you know, he's the one that provides life and breath and everything else. You are with your rabbi, being a follower, being a, a, a disciple. Listen to this quote. I love it. It's just too good. The first and most basic thing we can do and must do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part is thus practicing the presence of God, is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to him. In the early time of our practicing, meaning directing our minds, we, we, may ha we may well be challenged by our burdensome habit of dwelling on things less than God. But these are just habits, not the law of gravity, and can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps towards keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our soul, he will become the pole star of our inward being. Being a follower of Jesus means living in a constant state of awareness of God all day long. And this is why we encourage you to practice things like quiet times and prayer times and fasting and solitude. This is why we read our Bibles every day and why we encourage, why some of us have, have been encouraged to begin to practice the Sabbath. These are time-tested ways of remaining in the vine to present yourself before God, to get away from the chaos that is this world, to get away from the news anchors, to get away from the social media influencers, to get away from our constant uh, mind at hurry, and just to stop and slow down and breathe and remind ourselves, God, you have been here the whole time. I have not been here. I've been stuck in traffic. I've been on Instagram. I have been watching YouTube videos. I have been at work. I have been wherever I've been. I've been just angry at my children. I've been frustrated with what's going on in my country. I have not been here. Lord, you've been here, though. You, you have been here. God, I love you, and I need you. I need you in my life. I want to be with you. What percentage of your life, this is a question you can think about, what percentage of your life do you think about God? Is it only in the spiritual matters or is it, or is it in all matters? First goal is to be with your rabbi. The second one is to become like your rabbi. And this gets to the heart of who you choose to follow because following is becoming. <laughs> when you follow someone, you are becoming that person. And that's really at the heart and soul of what discipleship is. In Jesus' day, your goal was to become a carbon copy of the man you followed. You would literally, you would literally follow him around. You, you would copy the way he moves. You would copy his tone of voice. You would copy his mannerisms, his dress. You, you wanted to be just like him. Because you would then become his image bearer. I, when you look at me, you see Jesus. That's the thought, right? Now, we're all being formed into something. We may think we're unique. We may think we're independent, but you're not really. And so again, the question is, then who are you, who are you being formed? Or I, I guess, or who or what are you being formed into? Are you on track to look like Jesus? 
like just exposed, like uh, expressed through your personality and your gender and your socioeconomic level and your culture? Are you, exp- are, you, are you becoming a little version of Jesus? Which is, by the way, where we get the name Christian. The people who despised Christianity in the first century began to call Christians little Christs. Little Christs, which is, um, which is like the concept. You, you would be a little Christ. But, but my fear is that Christian people in our country, and I'm scared that disciples of Jesus are not becoming little Christ, but instead becoming little Democrats, or little Republicans, or little political activists, or little Donald Trumps, or little Beyonce's. That, that we don't look like him because we have been formed into the image of the world. And in that, we, we, this is the craziest part of it for me, we begin to trade the image of the glory of an immortal God for a, tree, a cheap, broken ripoff that the world has to offer. Like, you can look like the creator God, or you can look like Anderson Cooper. I don't know. You know, like, you can look like the creator God, or you can look like Ariana Grande. Like, and what, what happens is we are so obsessed with the world, and we can become so obsessed with the world, and I should say we are so tempted to become obsessed with that what ends up happening is we look like the people we follow instead of looking like Jesus. You start talking like them, responding like them. Your morals fade into their morals. Your attitude about life fades into their attitude about life. Your view of the oppressed or your view of the poor or your view, all of a sudden you start having stronger opinions about what the world is talking about than anything Jesus ever said. And I say to you, well, this is what the Bible says. And you say, well, no, 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 but this is what this person says on the news. This is the warning in Romans chapter 1. They trade the image of the immortal God for things made of wood, bronze, and gold. We trade becoming like God for becoming like the world. Listen to, what Jesus, listen to these words that Jesus says as a warning about this in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired man is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf, what does he do? He abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. You, you obviously know what he's saying. He is the good shepherd. The, the, the hired hands are the influencers of our world. And the, the wolf is Satan himself. Verse 13, it says, The man runs away, the hired man runs away, because he is a hired hand. And listen to this line. Cares nothing. Cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep. I want for my life what I hope that you want for your life. I want to mature and grow into the kind of person who is like Jesus from the inside out. Not just behaviors, because behaviors can be modified like whatever. But I want inward transformation from my heart. I want to be the kind of person for whom it's easier to love my enemy than to hurt them. Or to kill them. Or to gossip about them. Or to, to waterboard them or whatever. I want to be the kind of person for whom it's easier to trust God because I believe he is my father than to live stressed out and worried every single moment of my day. I want to be the kind of person for whom it's easier to care about the poor because I understand that Jesus cared about the poor. It's easier for me to care about them than to disregard them. I want to have that that type of direction in my life. 
pointed towards life and life to the full. Be with the rabbi. Be like the rabbi. The last one. Bring the rabbi's way. Bring it into the world. Bring it, bring his way. When Jesus called the disciples in Mark chapter 8 and also in Mark chapter 3, did you, did you catch what he said? He said, he called them so they would go out and preach. He says, be with them and then also preach. This, our church has not had a difficult time teaching or expressing. We've talked about evangelism a lot, but it's not just evangelism. Because why did they preach the gospel? Was it just to save their souls in heaven one day? Well, yes, but it wasn't just that. The other part was that Jesus believed that the kingdom of heaven was coming to the earth. He wanted to make the line between heaven and earth so thin because image bearers brought heaven to the earth. So as a disciple, we're called to do the same, preach, teach, heal, because the whole point of apprentice was to be one day like the rabbi, to carry on his work so that his message would never die. You remember Matthew 28, when Jesus is standing there with the disciples in Galilee, and he sends them out and says, I want you to go make disciples. What is he saying? Would you bring my way? Would you bring my way? As I see it, you can break down Jesus' kingdom work into a bunch of categories. At the end, I'm going to have a list, but I'm going I'm to read some, some of these things off. Here's a short list. He was preaching the gospel. He trained people to follow his way of life. He cast out demons, which means, and he also healed the sick. He ate and drank with people who were far from God. He did justice. He was a peacemaker. He prayed. He spent time in community. He trained others to make disciples, and he stood up against religious and political corruption. Now, these are things, if you're a disciple, that you, every one of those things we should eventually be doing. And I say eventually because it's not like you wake up tomorrow and your mother Teresa. Right? It requires some, some work, and I'll get to that in a second. But this was the goal, right? The goal would be that you would join Jesus in bringing the kingdom's work to Broward County. And so here's a quick review. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and bring Jesus' way. And why do we do it? Well, because it's the best life you could possibly live. As a, as a matter of fact, it's not just the best life you could possibly live. I, I may shock you with this thought, but this is actually life. Everything else is not life. In the passage we read in John chapter 10, you, you may want to catch, catch this because it's just so good. Jesus is the best communicator there, there's ever been. It says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. It says, I have come that you may have life, comma, and have it to the full. The thief comes, still steals, kills, and destroys. And before that comma, Jesus says, I came to bring you life. See, <laughs> the only way to actually live as it was intended to be lived, as life was intended to be lived, is to live as Jesus called you to live. Everything else is sinking sand. Everything else is fake life. So when you live not as Jesus, you're actually not living. You're just being, I don't know, you're like a, a disentangled spirit or something weird. You're not really human because humans were invented and created by God Almighty, and so he gave them instructions about how to be a human. So if, if this computer doesn't function right, it's doesn't then be, it's not then useful as a computer. Do you get what I'm saying? If it's not functioning as a computer, it's not really a computer. It's just like a, a bunch of metal parts. If you aren't doing what Jesus called you to, if you aren't living the way Jesus called you to live, you're actually not living. You're just flesh and bones. You're actually dead. Everything else is advertisement. Everything else is just a fraudulent, fake view of life. Following Jesus is the only way to actually live. I love this quote. It says that, it's by Dallas Willard. It says that the greatest issue facing the world today, with all of its heartbreak, 
27 million people in slavery, political corruption everywhere, all the heartbreaking things you see, all of them. The, the greatest issue facing the world is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices of Jesus, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of heaven into every corner of human existence. The greatest, the greatest need, the greatest issue facing our world today is whether or not disciples will live as disciples. That's it. That's it. The issue of whether or not you and I will be a disciple. So, will you? Will you? Will you be a little Christ or a little Democrat or a little Republican or a little whatever else? Will you be a disciple, a little Christ, or will you become a little chiropractor or a little student at college or a little whatever? You are invited, and I am in like that. Be with him. Become like him. Bring his purpose forward. Let me end with this. This kind of life where you love your enemy, where you're not racked by anxiety and greed, where you become part of a family that has a father and brothers and sisters, this kind of life that Jesus offers doesn't just happen by chance. It doesn't just happen by coming to church or, or watching online, you know, and thinking, wow, I got my Jesus stamp for the week. It doesn't happen like that. You're not going to become a disciple of Jesus by watching an hour of service, even though I love that you watch an hour of service. But instead, Jesus assumes in the Sermon on the Mount that this is going to be kind of hard. He assumes in the Sermon on the Mount that, you'll be, that, you, will, that you will deal with sin, that other people will have sinned against you. He assumes in the Sermon on the Mount that you'll have, have fights and arguments, that you'll be sued and dragged to court. He assumes that you'll have enemies. He assumes that you're going to deal with lust, that you're going to deal with your own greed problem. He assumes that life will be messy. But two times in the Sermon on the Mount, which is kind of like the edict of Christianity, two times he says the same word, practice. Jesus bookends the Sermon on the Mount at the very beginning and at the very end with the same call to practice. You might remember the famous one at the very end. He says, anybody who puts these words of mine into practice is like a wise builder. Is like a wise builder. Anybody who doesn't put these words into practice is like sinking sand. Jesus says, Join him, practice his way, practice his way. So I want to ask you, will you join me? I've been, this has been life-changing for me. Will you join me in practicing the way of Jesus? I'm going to leave this up on the screen, but I'm going to read it first. It's a lot of information. This is not the best way to do this, but whatever. Here's a list. This is not exhaustive, but it's a lot. This is what I've been working on. I've been thinking about a lot. Be with Jesus. How can you practice being with Jesus? Silence and solitude. Do you take a moment every day just to stop, be quiet, shut out the noise of the world, and just sit in solitude, considering who God is, how awesome and mighty he is, considering every breath that you take as a gift from God. Silence and solitude. The Sabbath. Some of us in the church are practicing this, taking a time during the day, taking a time during the day where we do nothing. You worship and you rest. Prayer, you know what that is. Bible study, you know what that is. Fasting. Fasting has become kind of like, no one does this anymore. Like, I don't know why, but, but it's a practice of Jesus to just spend time with him. Becoming like him. This, could be, this list could go on forever, but learning to forgive. Living simply. Addressing sin and temptation like Jesus was able to do while he was in the desert. Uh, a pursue a calling and live in community. And then bring Jesus' way to the world. Eat and drink with people far from God. Care for the sick. Teach the way of Jesus. Preach the gospel. Peacemake. Stand up um, against corruption. And then practice mercy or practice justice. These are things, this is not exhaustive. This is just things that I've been working on personally to begin to practice the way of Jesus. I left this on screen long enough so you could take a picture. Guys, in the world we're living in today, everybody is asking and clamoring for you to follow them. I want to encourage you not to do it. Don't 
follow them. Instead, follow the one who actually gives you life. Follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider um, the communion that we're about to take in a second and um, the bread and the, and the juice and um, as we think about just, just taking it, Lord, I pray that we can think about you. We can think about what you've done for us and how you've helped us, God. I pray that we can want to become your followers. Father, I know that we talked about so much today, but I, I pray that what, what is coursing through all of our veins is a new passion to be your disciple. God, let us remember that you were willing to die for this. Let us remember that you lived for this. And I pray that, Lord, that we can bring the kingdom of heaven to Broward County as it is in, as it is in heaven, Father. We love you, Dad. We thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Normally we ask you to take communion outside, but, but this week we're beginning to um, ask you to just take it inside so you can have a moment of, of solitude here. Um, consider um, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you. trust in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken take me, Jesus. Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee, fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me, I surrender. It's
Man, what an amazing service. service. Let's give a, a hand, hand for everybody. everybody. That's a part of it. Thank you so much. So I think about last week, we were all challenged to think through what would Jesus live like if he were you? And so I've been thinking through that challenge and thinking through, okay, what would he do if he were me? If he were a 24-year-old Hispanic man, if he was someone living with three other guys, like what, what would he do in my position? And so now this week we're challenged to think through, like, how do we practice this? How do we practice the way of Jesus. And so as Tony was speaking through the different things, like in his sermon, he asked, what percentage of my life is spent thinking about God? My heart had, had to wrestle through that. I need to think through that. When he asked about, is my opinion about what, is my opinion stronger about what the world is sharing or what the world is trying to lead me to, stronger than my opinion about what Jesus has said and what he's leading me to, I have to think through that. I have to learn, like, what do I need to do to practice the way of Jesus better? And so I hope that you guys spend some time thinking about those things. But again, I want to thank you for coming out. This was an amazing time. We're going to sing one more song. But before that, I want to let you know, if for those of you online or for those of you here, Kingdom Kids is going to be starting next week. So we're going to be working that out. We're excited to see your kids. There's going to be different parameters posted online. And we'll be able to communicate through that kind of a thing. But we're about to sing one more song. So if you could please rise, give your heart one more time. Thank you so much for coming out.
Have a great rest of your day. We love you guys. time being able to worship with you. I hope you enjoyed all the songs and I hope that you took the sermon to heart. I want to ask you guys to drop some things in the chat that you guys really got from this challenging sermon. I think for myself, if I start off the sharing, I, I think it's beautiful to sit down and think through how Jesus is the way. And I think we take that for granted because we hear it over and over again. But the disciples were so fired up to follow. They were so fired up to be able to be by him, to have his dust put onto him and to learn from his way. And I think I was really challenged by when Tony was asking about how, how much of my life, what percentage of my life do I sit down and think about God? Like am, as I'm walking through the grocery store, as I'm trying to go and, and, and exercise, or if I'm just waking up or if I'm making a bowl of cereal or any of those things, like am I thinking about God? Or is it just, hey, I woke up in the morning, thank you God. Or am I going to sleep at night, like thank you God. Like throughout my day as I'm driving, all of these different things, I have a vehicle, I have a life, I have friendships. Like there's so much to think about God because of but what are some things that you took away from today's sermon? I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a look in a couple seconds to see what the responses are, but I also wanted to share a second thing. I think the world has masterfully figured out a way to try to influence us. Not masterfully because Jesus has a better way, but we're so, so bogged down by different things that the world teaches. And I, I think it's challenging to think through, man, do I care more about what the world is trying to get me to care about, or do I care more about the scriptures, what Jesus is getting me to like care about? and what he commands. But taking a look at the chat, I, be, I can become like Christ more daily is what Carolyn says. And that's true, I think all of us agree with that. All of us want to, to go in that direction. Roxana says, follow Jesus, he is the way. And he is, 100%, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And um, here, like just looking at what Stacy said, we are living, we are only living if we are living the way Jesus calls us to live in his footsteps. And I think that might have been the root and the most powerful thing of what was said today. Life is empty if we're not following Christ. I'm very grateful that we were able to have this candid conversation, this focused time to think through these things in this chat. But I want to welcome you back for next week. If this was your first time, I want to remind you to go and you can check out the, the QR code or you can go back through the live stream and find that so you can scan it, we can get connected, but you are invited, you, your family, your uncle, your cousins, the friend that you forgot about in middle school that you just remembered right now, you are welcome to, to come by, come by in person if you feel comfortable or come by back on YouTube or Facebook, whichever method that you're watching by, but we're grateful for you, we pray that you have a great day, thank you so much, bye.